Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Unlocked. I'm your host, Tracy Wilson, and today I've got a really awesome guest for you guys. We've just been having a, a really great conversation behind the scenes. This is the amazing Jason Voyevich, and uh, today he's going to share some really awesome insights into history. So we're going to kind of do a bit of a, a, a look around in our ve- rear vision mirror to see what's gone on in history, in particular, to do with the American presidents, presidents. So over the last you know number of decades or centuries, in fact, there have been certain patterns, certain things that have gone on. And as I've read Jason's book, which we'll tell you a lot about in today's show, uh, it's been really fascinating the way in which he actually put that together in understanding what's gone on in history and then actually making some correlations to what's going on today. Now, I'm not going to spill the beans too much because I want to tell you a little bit about him first and give you a bit of his backstory. Story. So he's got a career that actually spans more than 25 years. He's launched hundreds of products, everything from medical devices to virtual healthcare systems to non-dairy consumer cheese to next generation alternatives to the dreaded, you know, cone of shame for pets. That big thing that they put around their heads. My son only had one of them on his dog the other day. Thanks to you, Jason. And also the sex aids for cows. Uh, yeah, you want to you want to say what? Really, sex aids for cows? Yep, really. And he's also a graduate of both minister of the University of Wisconsin and the University of Minnesota, where he's completed his postgraduate studies at the MIT Sloan School of Management. His formal training has been absolutely invaluable, but he actually credits his true success to growing up in a family of artists, immigrants, and entrepreneurs. And they taught him how to carefully observe the world, see patterns before others actually notice them, and use those insights to create new innovations. And Jason's favorite way to observe the world, he believes, is from actually looking back in the past, because they have that has plenty to teach us about the challenges and the new opportunities that we actually face today. So today's conversation is going to be packed jam full of, um, of, I suppose, history, but also looking at that history and how how we're actually seeing a lot of history actually play out again in the world that we are in today. So, you know, we might go down a few little rabbit holes from time to time, um, but I'm also going to say to Jason, I I can thank he and his family for many calories that have been put on my hips over many years because I just happen to love Neapolitan ice cream. Now, I'm not going to tell you too much more about that because I'm sure Jason will tell you about uh, his family history and why the heck I'm blaming he for, uh, for a number of calories that have been put on my hips over a number of years. Yes. So thanks very much. I love Neapolitan ice cream. You well, are welcome. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Tracy. It's such a it's such a pleasure to be here and uh, talk with you. And yes, it was my family's fault. Uh, they, I have a grandfather who invented Neapolitan ice cream. Uh, I had a grandfather uh, on my wife's side who invented the bazooka uh, in World War One. Uh, I have a, another grandfather on my mother's side, and they emigrated from Cuba in the 1960s to the United States, and they invented disposable coffee filters, and they manufactured those. So it's a variety, and that's not even scratching the surface. My father was an artist, a creative director, a madman. If you've wa- ever watched the show <laughs> Mad Men, uh, mm-hmm. I grew up thinking that was normal. Just if, if that gives you any, any sense for what kind of a person I am, it's you watched Don Draper, you watched that. That was uh, childhood for someone like me. So uh, no, I, I, it's what's interesting, what I, uh, what I love about history really is in product development, in communication, in leadership, we face so many challenges. There, there's so many new things. We have so much coming at us all the time that it sometimes can feel really overwhelming that we need to come up with these answers all on our own all the time. And what I learned early on and what my parents and my family taught me was, boy, if you read carefully, other leaders have faced sim- similar situations. What mm-hmm. could you learn from them? What, what could you learn from someone who handled the situation like that? And what could you do differently? What could you do this? What could you do the same? How could you adapt that? So it's not, I don't feel like I'm alone, that I have to figure out all these things by myself. I've got hundreds of people 
whose wisdom I can I can call on if I just know where to look. Absolutely, and and I, you know, how what an exciting thing for you, and how lucky are you to have grown up in a family like that that has just you know instilled in you and clear that 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 has been you know passed down um, through the genes for generations. You know that that uh, you've just got the innovation gene and that that thirst for continuous uh, learning and development and. But also, like you say, looking back into history and saying, well, what can I see there that I, that could actually help me navigate my way around maybe some challenges, and but also some opportunities that exist right. today. So I, I want to ask you this question first. Like you've clearly, you know, like having that, that um, list of all sorts of different developments and innovations that you have been in. Like, how do you firstly, we'll get to the book side of things in a minute, but no. from a, from a, a uh, because right now in, in society, right, we've got, like, I think about the number of people that are uh, being displaced in their jobs. And so a right. lot of them are now thinking about, and I think I read something yesterday that in the United States alone, it's something like um, 40, I have this written down, 41 odd percent of people are actually um, looking to quit their job and start something anew. Or they've been dis or they've been displaced because they're not they, right. they don't you know kind of going along with the current narratives and they don't want to uh, they don't want to play along with those so they want to create something for themselves. So for someone like you, when you talk about I can I'm not alone, I can actually look at history or look at other people and see what did they do to help me create my new future, my and how do I innovate in the world that I'm in now. What piece of pieces of advice could you give to people today that are in that kind of situation? What would you what would you suggest they do right now? I think that the biggest thing I see when people are being displaced, and that's not just happening in the United States. It's uh, you know, we we in the United States tend to have a bias to things happening in the United States, but when you take a broader look and you start to see well, what's happening in China right now? What's happening in Australia in your area of the world? What's happening in Africa? What's happening in South America? What you realize is that the economies are changing, that people's expectations are changing, that there is new technology coming at us very, very quickly. And sometimes that can feel really overwhelming. I think the best piece of advice I could give people is read books about the 1920s. Let me explain why I say that. Okay? Uh -huh. When we think about the 1920s, we think, oh, that's, you know, those, the hairstyles, the, uh, on Downton Abbey, you ever watched Downton yeah. Abbey? They uh -huh. had, towards the end of that show, there was the Downton Abbey movie and they all had hairstyles in the 1920s and they had, the dancing was cool and it was the roaring 20s and it was all this excitement. What people forget is when you take a look at all the list of innovations and change uh, that happened during the 1920s, let's just name a few. The automobile, obviously. Mm -hmm. The airplane. Okay, mm -hmm. Just think about those two things. That's it. If, you'd, if that was the end of the list, that would be transformative. But it wasn't. Radio, television was invented during that time. The electric razor, the refrigerator, the dishwasher. Uh, you could name 50 or 60 different innovations that happened. Quantum theory was invented in the 1920s. So when we think about, oh, gosh, who has lived through this kind of transformational change before? Everyone who lived in the 1920s had to. If you were born, if, if you took a person from the 1950s and you brought them to today, Someone from the 1950s would be able to figure out our world pretty easily. Okay. They'd be able to, well, okay, you drive, you have a refrigerator, you go out to restaurants. Okay, I got all that. Things would be like, okay, there's, I'm looking at a computer right now. The computer has a keyboard on it that doesn't look that different than a typewriter, does it? I mean, fundamentally, not that different. If you took someone from 1900 and brought them to 1950, the world would be completely unrecognizable. Absolutely 100% unrecognizable. They would not know how to process it. There are so many new things. So when I think about blockchain 
I think about artificial mm -hmm. intelligence. I think about, you know, climate technologies and innovations that are coming with climate science, uh, renewable energy, all of those things. And people say, oh, it's just so overwhelming. I can't keep up with everything that's happening with cryptocurrencies. You can figure that out. Back mm -hmm. in the 1920s, we worked through that period and you can learn how people reacted, how they changed. When you start to think that, hey, just the understanding that someone else made it through that, they figured out, you know, there was no home mortgage in the United States before the 1920s. Uh, that was when it was invented, that that entire kind of that you'd buy a home using a 30 year mortgage that didn't exist before. Think about that. All those things that think about how transformative it was. You see how people adapted to that. You, you know what? We can figure out blockchain. You know, we mm -hmm. we can figure out these sort of things. We'll we'll get through it. No problem. So essentially what you're saying, Jason, like when we look at history, like we're not talking about things that we do that is necessarily a quantum leap. They, they these things happen. It's 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 a, it's an evolution and they happen, you know, a bit by bit over time. And as they roll out, and we as humans, we we're pretty smart creatures, right? We we get to adapt, we learn how to how to to adapt to the new environment and it doesn't always happen like you say it's not like taking somebody from you know the, the 1800s and, and transporting them into to today's world and saying well now, now live like like you would uh, you know try and figure out today's world right. no it's that there, there is a slow evolution and things unfold over time but what you are saying like what when i read the book and i've i've looked at um a lot of the literature that you've put out you know it's chunking things down and when we start to understand that that things happen um almost like in in bite-sized pieces is, is the way that i would like to put it that it makes it more it makes it much easier to comprehend to understand and it becomes a lot less overwhelming because it doesn't feel like it's this massive quantum leap that I've got to try and take everything on board all in a really short space of time. I also loved, like, one of the things that I wanted to talk about, like, when we think about marketing and advertising, right. let's talk about that as a concept um, firstly and, and maybe even give people a little bit of a bit of a um, understanding of the difference or the 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 marriage between the two of those how do they marry together and what is the difference between the two of those because i think marketing and advertising like is always been there is it is this this um concept of you know that we've got on the screen here you know relationships pricing value propositions product development and then how do we actually persuade people right. to actually take on board the new thing that we are creating so um so how do, so, so let's give everybody a little bit of an insight into that because I love how you explain that. I think the the way I found the easiest way to explain it to people is advertising is a part of marketing. And it, it not the other way around. I like to think of it uh, like an iceberg. Uh, and of an iceberg met metaphor, advertising is the piece that you see above the waterline. That's the thing that everyone pays attention to and that gets all the attention. What you really don't realize is that there's a huge amount of marketing that happens beneath the scenes. That's how the product is designed. Uh, how does the product work? How is it priced? How do you get it? Do you buy it on Amazon? Do you buy it in the physical store? Do you get it online? All of those different things uh, contribute to the message that you see at the top. Uh, so when, when you really, when you're starting to think about the difference between marketing and advertising, it's why I called it marketer in chief and not advertiser in chief, mm -hmm. because there are so many things that come into what it takes to market an idea or market a product. That's a lot more than just the message that, mm -hmm. you know, this isn't, I didn't want to write a book about campaign literature and, the persuasive strategies of one candidate versus another candidate. We touch on that in the book here and there, but really what's so much more interesting, just like you said, Tracy, is when you, you know, you kind of dip beneath the waterline and you start to see why something works. That's when it gets really exciting. And that's where all the lessons come. All the things you can take away are under the waterline. 
and, and I love this concept, like you just alluded to that there, the reason that you called the book itself marketer-in-chief and not advertiser-in-chief, but also the fact that you, you sort of looked at at uh, the presidents of, of America and said, well, what if we actually looked at them through a completely different lens? What if we looked at them rather than being the chief executive officer of a country? What if I actually looked at them as the, you know, the marketing um, officer of a country, the marketer in chief of that of that right. country? And and then we can make this correlation. Like as I was reading it, I'm like the correlation between, all right, so I'm reading this. It's about, yes, it's about US presidents. And for a lot of people that might be outside of the US, you might think, well, why would I want to read a book like that? And to be honest, you know, but, Living, I mean, I'm from New Zealand. I now live in Australia. You know, uh, um, I'm interested in, in my own history. You know, why the heck would I want to read a book about um, about you know, American history? But the point is that when you do start to read it and you start to understand and you can see, you know, what these presidents did and what the patterns were, and then you start thinking about it from a entrepreneurial and a business perspective that gives you a much deeper uh i suppose insight and connection with with the information that you are reading so as i was reading i just wanted to make that point because i think a lot of people particularly those of us that are outside of the united states might think well why would i want to learn that um but it's actually really fascinating when you do and you you come at it from that perspective when you come at it from you are an entrepreneur you are a business owner right now and we are we're all trying needing to navigate this world that we now live in and like jason said earlier you know a lot of the history um and the the, the history books that have been written actually give us some really good insight and some really good wisdom in the way in which we can start navigating our way through the challenges and the obstacles but also how we can uh how we can look at new opportunities that we we may also be faced with too because i think there's a lot of those so, so um yes yeah so so in inside of the book like i i was going through and you were talking about kind of these six different what would we call them like communication styles um you know or the way in which we adapt to things and and yeah. you've categorized each of the presidents in this way so i want to sort of unpackage those six um uh, uh, you know ways in which you've categorized them because they are very very relevant to business today and i want to ask our listeners now as we start to un unpackage these i want you to think about it from a perspective of which are you you know which one of these categories as a business owner and as an entrepreneur do you actually fit into in this moment in time and are you somebody who is constantly adapting are you somebody that is evolving because i think maybe even though in the book and in, in the way in which you've summarized uh, the book that you've categorized everybody in this way but i would like to think to say that i think people continue to evolve and they develop and maybe we actually move through each one of those uh you know those different um categories over time so let's start with innovators let's kind of unpackage this concept of innovator and and when again when i go back and i looked at the book you know the ones that stood out for me there were a couple but we'll start with um george washington uh because you know you'd already mentioned this you brought up the subject of cryptocurrency uh right. bitcoin and the like and if we if we go back and and firstly kind of unpackage what does it mean to be an adapter why did you put George Washington in that category? And uh, what was it that he did about currency that made that made him fit into that category as a as a as an innovator? I think uh, Washington's an interesting case when we think about the United States of 1780s. Uh, you know, people think, oh, it's 1776, the Declaration of Independence was signed, and poof. Uh, we have a fully formed constitutional republic and things are happening. That's not actually the case. That's not actually what happened. You had to fight a war, you had to win the war, and you had to write a constitution afterwards. It, very much in the way I structure the book is uh, around how a new product enters the marketplace and it evolves over time. Mm -hmm. There is no real difference. The point I make is that there's no real difference between a product uh, innovating in a marketplace and evolving 
and an idea. Uh, products are just ideas with some physical wrapping around them. That's really all they are. You're really buying an idea. And what's interesting about George Washington is one of the first things he faced wasn't, you know, kind of a, you know, the, the war and all of those things. It was really, most people don't know this, in the 1780s, the most popular currency in the United States was a Spanish peso. And mm. the reason people used it, it was it was ubiquitous. It was everywhere. And each state even had their own currency. The federal government had its own currency, the continental. Uh, and there were Spanish pesos. Or you bartered with other people. What Washington realized is that to tie the country together and to finance, to pay the war debt, it needed to have a currency. Well, what's the idea behind money? There's no, when we think about, well, what is money? Well, is money coins? Is it dollar bills? Is it banknotes? Really, money is simply the belief that your government will have uh, the ability to, you know, you'll be able to exchange that dollar bill for some item of value somewhere else. If you don't have that, if people don't believe that and they can't make that exchange, well, there's no real reason to believe that that money has any value. So at its core, money is just about belief. And what Washington did is through Congress and through Alexander Hamilton and other people, put the structure in place so that would, people would believe that the currency was worth what, worth what it was printed on. Mm -hmm. Unless you do that, unless you figure out that connection to belief, unless you really sell people that idea it doesn't, the rest of it doesn't really matter. What's, what's funny, the, the story I like to uh, uh, relay about that in a very tangible way is that the first U.S. dollars were essentially knockoff pesos. They, they were essentially, they, they look the same, they were structured the same, they were about the same weight. The whole deal, because Alexander Hamilton and George Washington realized that people would, it would be easier for them to change a little bit than to adopt some per some totally new currency that they had never seen before. This one just looked like a different sort of peso. And it was extremely popular and it caught on. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about with belief. And really, when we talk about innovation, that really early stage stuff, it's all about how you're selling that idea to people who do not believe you and who do not think. Like, for instance, when we talk about an Elon Musk, for instance, mm -hmm. did anyone believe that, you know, when he first, his first car wasn't the Tesla Model S, it was that little Roadster. No mm -hmm. one believed at the time that, hey, we, that Hertz, the rental car company, would buy a hundred thousand of them for it to basically remake its rental fleet to be completely electric. No one believed him. He had to create that from an idea that we should electrify vehicles. Mm -hmm. Kind of an old idea, actually, but to commercialize it against huge competition, against no one who believed him. And now Ford just decided, and GM just decided, big automakers have decided, we're going to go electric within 10 years. We're not gonna, other than just a few gas models, we're going electric. And I think, you know, when you look at the communication that was required at that time, like it, it with uh, George Washington and even with the likes of Elon Musk, I mean, that all came down to, to one thing, trust, right? right. And, and, and having to build this, uh, to build the amount of communication around that to get a, a society, to get a country, to get your audience let's call it that because it didn't matter right. you know in, in in anything we do you've got to understand who the heck am i talking to which is you know your audience so whether you're the president whether you're elon musk you know he was speaking to a very specific audience in order to get them to understand the new thing and right. understand uh how it was going to be see the vision but also trust that it was just so like you say we trusted that that piece of paper that we got because that's literally all it is that's is that it. we trust that it's actually got some weight it's worth something and that i can actually exchange it for what it's worth so i think you know when i look at, at these things it's, it's trust and 
And because you'd mentioned earlier, and, and this is something that is you know, a hot topic right now around Bitcoin and crypto. And, and obviously we had all of the early adopters like, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing the vision. I see it right now. They jumped in. And then over time, you know, you get, um, you know, you might get a few more people, a few more people. And we look at the, the bell curve with all of that. Right. Um, it, but it, again, it's about trust, right? So we want to make sure that people are sitting back and we're, and, and not only with Bitcoin, you're also seeing this even with, is it to say, you know, vaccinations you know you've got those early adopters who are like yep i'm in give it to me and then there's the others that go through various stages of i require some more of some more level of uh information to get me to the point where i actually trust that what you're telling me is actually true and is is going to be okay for me so it's interesting when we, we kind of start to unpackage these um, these presidents and their communication styles and the things that actually went on. And I know that in the book, you're only looking at very specific kind of right. um, moments in time and, and everything has its time and its place and there's context around it. But, you know, I think you've be you've done this really beautifully in being able to understand what went on back then, what the opportunities are now and what's actually going on today. The other thing that I do want to say is, and I mentioned this at the beginning with Jason. So, um, when we were off screen, that a lot of people are unsettled right now. And what's what's great about what you've done is that it actually gives, it can give people a sense of, I'm going to say, uh, comfort, security, to know that this is a moment in time, that we will move through what's going on right now, whatever that might be for you, and we will have something else new come in 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 its right time so you know that's one really great thing that we can get take away from the history uh that from the history books for today is that this is just a moment in time and it will pass um the other thing that i that i noticed like when we're talking about in, innovators so let's just just for a moment i want to i want to explain what jason means by an innovator so in the book he talks about an innovator being the people that are the risk takers they they are playing risk takers, plain and simple, right? So they, they um, there's no data, there's no precedent, there's no safety net for these guys. They're the ones that kind of uh, burn the boats. Let's go. We're moving in that direction and there is no way back. Um, every decision is their first decision. In each case that they, when we're looking at our, um, at, from a presidential point of view, the ones that are paving a new way, they're move, they're, they're paving the way forward. They're creating a new identity where nothing existed before. So, for some of you guys that are listening today, you might actually be in that innovative phase. So, we got to call it a phase because you're creating something brand new, right. something that's never been done before. Maybe you're developing a brand new company that has there's no rule books, there's no systems, procedures, processes, you know, so a, a president that you could go back and look at would be somebody like the George Washington in America, um, George Washington, John Adams, uh, and even looking at people like, or some movements that have been going on, like Black Lives Matter, or even uh, with the likes of Greta um, Thunberg, who, you know, who's gone out and they've actually starting to pave the way or shaking things up. So just, um, you know, look at some of those people if you're in that phase of, of business or life right now where you're actually in the innovation phase. The next one I wanted to look at was like this, this concept of early adopters. And we've sort of segued into this, I think, because we've spoken a little bit about those people that you know are ready to jump in, that the early adopters, they, they're ready to take on something new that's just been brought out. So let's give everybody a little bit of a um, a bit of a backstory or, or insight into what do we mean by an early adopter? What sort of person is that? An early adopter, and a lot of this, if if you're really interested in a ton more just on the kind of theoretical side, it was Ev Rogers uh, in the 1960s came up with this idea called the diffusion of innovations. And if you've seen, if you're an entrepreneur and you've looked at the bell curve of innovation from innovator, early adopter, early majority, this is what we're talking about here. It, it's all about psychology. People think it's about technology and it's about, okay, well, what new technical innovation in Bitcoin is there going to be? It's not really that at all. And what you're getting at, Tracy, is the psychology that changes over that time. And what we mean is mm -hmm. these are people who are still taking risks, but they're not blazing a completely new trail. 
They are when, for instance, when people ask, well, well, who came up with the idea for McDonald's, the restaurant? And they ask, mm -hmm. well, well, it was Ray Kroc who mm -hmm. came up with it. No, actually, it wasn't. It was the McDonald's brothers who came mm -hmm. up with the idea for McDonald's. They had a couple of restaurants in Southern California, and it was Ray Kroc who looked at that and said, you guys figured out, you guys innovated I'm going to take it to the next step. I'm going to take that good idea and I'm going to start to make something with it. For the entrepreneurs and the innovators in your audience, you might be seeing that, okay, well, it's not a brand new idea. I'm taking something that someone has already thought of, but not a whole lot of people are buying yet. And I want to jump in right when I start to see that curve take off. That's what an early adopter is. They're risk takers, but they're a little bit more careful. They're, they're waiting to make sure that they, you know, that something's real before they jump on. It's almost like, we, you know, we're on the cliff. You, you, you jump first and if you survive and, and you know, you pop up uh, uh, under that deep water, then, then I'll give it a go. Uh, but I might do a backflip <laughs> while, I'm, while I'm doing it too, right? You know, so, I, so I look pretty, pretty cool as, as, I, as I do it. So that, that's kind of how I would, um, you know, I look at the analogy that I would use for these early adopters. You know, it's kind of like I'm seeing somebody else has done it. Uh, how can I take what they've done, make it better, faster, stronger, you know, whatever I need to do? How do I how do I actually just innovate on that and make it a little bit better? Uh, and then and then, you know, use that as my opportunity. And in, and I think in every um, at, at, at any moment in time, there are opportunities for us to do that. And sometimes, you know, when we look back again in history, there's often people who have gone out and maybe things haven't gone as well as they, they should have, you know, maybe they failed. And a lot of that doesn't always come down to the thing that they were creating was not great. It was just the timing was off, you know, that the uh, market wasn't ready for it. And then you might want to look at those and go, well, actually, now's the time for me to bring something up like that out. Um, you know, now's the time for me to bring forth that particular idea, maybe tweak it, innovate on it a little bit and uh, and bring it back to the market. So, you know, I wanted today's show to really give people the opportunity because there are so many people looking for what's my next move? What do I need to do next? That this actually gives you the opportunity to maybe look at some some history, look at um, and what maybe what's been done before, and then think about how can you innovate on that and is the timing right for you to be able to enter the market with something new, which is, is quite a cool thing to do because you don't have to start from scratch then. The, the next, um, did you want to add something to that? Sorry, Jace. No, I think that's, I, I think that's excellent. I think a lot of entrepreneurs sometimes think that they have to come up with this brand new idea that if if they see something else out in the marketplace, they Google it and they say, well, someone else has already done that particular thing. I, I need to keep looking to find my idea. Well, really, you don't have to start at the very beginning. It is completely OK to see the kind of mess that happens, see what sorts out. A lot of people have been doing that with cryptocurrency, for instance. Mm -hmm. They've been looking at there's been so many different things. They've kind of crashed and burned. I think there was a squid game NFT that just yeah. came out and it lost 99% of its value in a day. This is That's still a hallmark of an innovative market. Once mm -hmm. you start to get to the point where that sort of thing doesn't happen anymore. There might be a lot of different coins and a lot of different NFTs out there, but there's starting to be a little bit of predictability. The mainstream market hasn't caught on, but it's not this complete wild west. Well, I use that metaphor in the United States. We know what that means. It means kind mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, untamed we wilderness. We, we, you, yeah. I suppose uh, you Aussies know what that is as well. Maybe yeah. it's, it's not an outback sort of thing. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's on the coast. Uh, they figured it out. This is, that's what's, uh, if there could be any advice I give to entrepreneurs, you, you, can, you don't have to pick being an innovator. You could pick that next stage of the market psychology, which is all about early adopters. It's a little bit safer, but there's still plenty of opportunity there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. So the next phase in war, the, the category that we look at is the, the concept of the early majority. So, um, you know, this is, again, if we use that analogy of, you know, I'm standing on the cliff, 
you know, good old JC's jumped off. He, he's, he's um, you know, he's the innovator. He's gone and and he popped up. And then Trace comes along and she wants to jump off their turn. I'm going to do a few black flips and what have you. And then we've got this whole, you know, team of people behind us that say, well, they did it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it a go too. I'm ready to, I'm ready to, to, um, to, to take the plunge as well. So, so let's talk a little bit about this early majority. And, and like Jason said, what we're doing today is, you know, really thinking about the psychology and, and understanding how how we as humans really, um, how we behave, and and how we how you can use that to your advantage when it comes to understand or innovating, developing and creating a new opportunity for yourself in this current environment. So let's talk a little bit about this this early majority. I think the, the story I like to tell about the early majority is when I was a kid, the microwave oven was becoming a mainstream sort of thing. When I, when I was a little kid, when I was born, the microwave, the psychology around people buying microwaves was still innovator early adopter. Uh, they were expensive, they were kind of hard to use, but you could you could still get one. It wasn't quite a brand new invention, but it certainly wasn't anything that the average family had. When you take a look at that early majority sort of piece, that's the part of that bell curve that is going steeply upward. And what's happening there is the, ma the majority of people are looking at the innovators, they're looking at the early adopters, and you're starting to get that kind of mass market, that mass psychology going. It's becoming trendy. It's becoming a thing. So when business owners and entrepreneurs look at markets like that, you've got to get in. And that's a case where it's not about creating a brand new idea. It's not even figuring out kind of where in the early stages you want to be you need to be ready to move and respond to that kind of market demand because it is growing really, really, really fast. And who wins there are the ones that can really take advantage of that scale. And that's where if you're careful and you do it well, you can grow very quickly, very fast. But if you're not careful and you don't have the kind of infrastructure in place, you're not treating your employees well, you have a culture that's not working. Uh, you have a supply chain that is uh, under stress. Uh, have we seen any of those things happen right now? Absolutely, we have. If you're in an early majority market where it is growing fast, 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 and you have any of those problems, it can completely ruin what you had in mind. And this is what happened to the United States during that time. The leaders that were present during that time in the early majority all of the things that didn't get solved, all of those kind of nasty issues that just didn't get addressed during the earlier stages came to roost when the country grew, doubled, tripled, quadrupled in size mm. over the course of 20, 30 years. That's when the United States went through the Civil War. It mm. was because it, did, it didn't happen that it, the, those issues weren't handled. We see this in companies too, right, Tracy? Absolutely. That, that companies that are growing really fast, Tesla went through this. We use them as an example again. Tesla went through exactly this when it couldn't get batteries, it couldn't get the supply chain, it couldn't, it promised the Model 3 and had a whole bunch of people go out and pre order the car and then couldn't deliver on it in time. Mm -hmm. And yes, it figured out the, you know, Elon Musk and team figured out how to get past that, but. It's not that was a very rocky period in Tesla's history, and it has happened again and again with companies as they grow fast. If there's something wrong, if there's a skeleton in the closet, that skeleton comes out and starts knocking heads. Mm -hmm. And you know, given given my background uh, being in you know in finance, I mean, I saw oh, loads, you know. loads of businesses go bust because they actually grew too fast. It's actually one of the major reasons that most businesses actually fail is because they they don't have the infrastructure, they don't have the support systems in place to actually support their rapid growth. Exactly. And so you know, they're jumping up and down thinking it's happy days when uh, you know behind them it's like oh my gosh, there's this massive 
um, you know, a mass destruction uh, left in it, left in its trail. And if they they either had to have deep pockets to be able to uh, fill the gaps, and if you didn't have that, well, you know, bankruptcy was uh, was usually uh, what was you know looming pretty near, or they had to make some pretty swift moves to get themselves back on track. So it it, it can be a very um, you know tumultuous time for people if they if they're not very very careful. Some of the um, what, what's quite interesting is like when I looked at the the presidents that you looked at in these in this particular category being the early early adopters you know and we talk about um again where you categorize this being the early adopters the the majority presided over a period of rapid growth and expansion and like, like most new innovations any problems that they could sweep under the carpet or sweep under the rug early um often burst into full view uh, further down the track and you know you just mentioned that with the you know skeletons in the closet they come out um and they can actually threaten you and derail the entire thing the presidents that that were um that stood out to me was obviously abraham lincoln and he tried right. to get around that obviously by trying to diffuse a lot of situations um lucky for him he had a bit of uh humor on his side so he could use that to 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 try and win people over right um right. some of the president yeah, some of the presidents or prime ministers of today don't necessarily have that uh have that skill up their sleeve um <laughs> and the other is uh grover cleveland uh you know who who uh, also was used, you know, it, it was trying to control um, a lot of, I suppose, the, the country's people by by giving companies the opportunity to, to be able to control people's lives. And we're kind of seeing that in today right. uh, with like a data and, you know, data giving, giving companies um, what we would call, you know, power, big data, uh, giving people power of today and we're seeing a lot of pushback around that so it's quite interesting again when you go back in this history and we look at some of those uh, various different presidents and we see what's gone on and then you can actually see like if you're not in favor of some of those things maybe you might want to go and have a look at and see what some of the people did to to uh to overthrow or overcome some of those challenging right. times the next is this group four, which is the late majority. And you talk about this being um, during the late um, majority, businesses and nations can do whatever they set their mind to. If they made it through the challenges of rapid growth, uh, then the, the only limit limitation is really their imagination. Uh, and this is, um, you know, what, what you guys saw. Well, what the United States had the kind of the good old days um, or seen as like the, the place to be, the land of land of uh you know opportunity um so so you guys went through a lot of that and and let's talk a little bit about um you know the late majority and how that applies to business today and i know that you've got a number of different uh, presidents that you that you put into this category and there's a couple right. that i've yeah. kind of pulled out as being um, I suppose ones that are familiar to me is probably the ones that I've pulled out, right? Um, but also the ones that when you you summarise them and you you made some correlation to to what's gone on today, I kind of pulled them out as well because I'm like, hmm, I'm seeing a pattern here. I'm seeing that go on today. I right. wonder what they did, and it, it sort of piqued my curiosity. So William McKinley was one that um, that you had in your book that you spoke about, and he he he's talked about the media. Um, way back then, it was, and I, don't quote me on the, the time, I mean, Jace would know more about the dates and times because i got no clue, but I could just, um, you know, talk about the particular person and uh, and, and the, the instance that he speaks about in the book. And you were talking about how back when uh, when William McKinley was in, um, in, in charge, that this was the first time that he had to really try and use, um, I suppose, the journalists and uh, media to try and sway the opinions of the people. But also he was saying, you know, journalism and uh, the media is not neutral ground. You know, that that's actually incorrect. And we're kind of seeing a lot of that in today's times, right? right? I think what's important to understand about journalism in the United States and globally in, in many cases is that journalism is a business. You know, there are a few places the BBC in in the UK is publicly funded, but they're not all that way. In most places in the world, the uh, journalism has a profit motive. It needs to make money. It needs to reach an audience. And what happened around that time was called the yellow journalism era in uh, in our history. And uh, there are uh, 
similarities around the world where it was very partisan. It was very point of view. It, 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 the same sort of thing, the right and the left that we see today in our media is exactly what we saw then, really very much the same thing. And it was the media that helped kind of goad William McKinley into war with the Spanish uh, for the in the Spanish-American War. Uh, you know, they made a really big deal out of the, you know, the sinking of the USS Maine and Havana Harbor in Cuba. Uh, whether or not that was an accident or not, the newspapers at the time made it into a this terrible event that we needed to avenge. And William McKinley uh, was caught really flat footed in the beginning. He didn't really understand kind of the power that the media had to shape public opinion. Once he realized it, though, and, you know, once that crisis was passed, he started to court the media. He started to make sure that he mm -hmm. had a media strategy. He was the first president that had a specific media strategy. And that's been, we've been living with the result of that over 120 years now, that leaders figured out that the media was critical. We needed to, uh, we needed to cultivate that strategy so that the leaders could use the media to help communicate their agenda. That was the first time we really saw it as a strategy that leaders of those types of organizations could face. And really that's the same idea here, right? That mm -hmm. every, every large organization that is at the top of its game absolutely has a media strategy. They, ha they, they know what kind of image they want to project into the market and they are very strategic about it. And this is where, you know, when you have that kind of market presence in Amazon, a Walmart, an Alibaba, a, you know, Mitsubishi, Hyundai, Samsung, any of these global organizations at the top of their game, absolutely cultivate global media all the time. Mm. They have to because they know how integral it is to maintaining their, maintaining their dominance and to help communicate this kind of grand vision of what they want to do. And that was the same thing with McKinley. And it's the same thing that leaders in the corporate world took the lesson to heart and they're still doing it today. Absolutely. I mean, and, and even, you know, if you can't get the attention of the big, of, of the, you know, journal, the, the media, the mainstream media, then what do you do? You know, these days we've got the likes of social media and, uh, you know, even as a, as a smaller, you know, if you're a smaller entrepreneur, what do they do? They've twigged on to the fact that they also need to be able to use, um, you know, media as a way of being able to get their information right. out. We see that in the shape and form of influencers. And so right. that's where, you know, we have the influencer marketing uh, come to, to the forefront where we're starting to, you know, who are the big players that can influence um, decision making, persuade people. People to buy certain things so we'll go and find them and we'll try and get some airtime on their uh in their space to promote whatever it is that we're doing uh, for today and so what's quite interesting about this is that we mustn't forget that uh you know the media is um you know it's a for-profit uh, organizations and they will often um you know obviously speak the party line that's that's going to pay them pay, pay the bills um so it's it's often you know not always a uh a it's not neutral ground. You know, we're not always seeing uh, both sides of the story, depending on uh, who, who's paying the bills in that situation. So anyway, we'll digress. We'll, we'll come back to centre. We digressed a little bit there, but just a couple of little points to make, um, you know, in, in today's and uh, what we're seeing today. And it's and like Jason has said, this has gone on for many, 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 many decades, um, right way the back, right way back. Uh, back to, uh, to to William McKinley uh, when he was the president of the United States when he realised that hey I need to get the uh, I need to get the uh, the the media on board and uh, help get them to help me uh, to persuade the uh, the peoples that I'm actually doing the right thing. Anyway, let's get back on track. So group number five, the legates. So the legates are the still um, still command respect in the market. Uh, they are not unbeatable. Usually a high profile loss is a turning point. And uh, in, a, in 
the USA, uh, we saw that with the with the uh, resignation of President Nixon um, some some years ago. Some of the, the people that I've put into this category or that you've put into this category that were um, obviously ones that I remember, you know, the Jimmy Carters, the Ronald Reagans of, um, of the time, and even um, George H.W. Bush. So let's kind of unpackage, um, you know, the Leos. How do we put that into, make the correlation in, today, in today's world? What are we seeing today that is actually going on? That this is that yeah this is the this is a different kind of psychology it's a different sort of organization here that is clearly still important in the marketplace if you think about tesla as this innovative out there uh brand you could think about like a general motors as a laggard type organization one that just isn't quite what it used to be uh its best days might have been behind it it can still, you know, put. It can still sell a lot of cars. It can still sell a lot of trucks. It can still do great things. There are great things that were accomplished in the United States, you know, from Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, uh, Bush, Clinton, kind of in that era. It's not that great things couldn't happen. It's that we weren't. The United States was no longer completely in control of everything that was happening they could be the united states could be beaten and that's a really different sort of thing and you look at organizations that run into that situation as well where you know tesla's on the coming up and it's kind of you can't beat them right now but general motors ford chrysler opal mm -hmm. fiat you know name those kind of global brands well they're all struggling they're on the backslide of that curve and it can be a very stressful time to leave. Many, you know, many of your folks who are entrepreneurs on the side might be working inside an organization that is clearly past its prime, and it's stressful. It can be it can be difficult to innovate in an organization like that because, boy, what was happening, what made you money ten years ago, is just not making you money anymore. The classic example, of course, is Kodak. Yes. You know, where what was what made them money, essentially film for film cameras. Well, when digital cameras came out, there was an overlap there. If you remember, you could buy a film camera and a digital camera. The digital cameras for a long time weren't as good. I remember going on photo shoots in, early in my career where the photographer would shoot some early drafts on a Polaroid. And maybe do that. He replaced his Polaroid at first with a digital camera just to do the, you know, do the basic framing and lighting. But he would always go to the film camera to do the final shots. Well, by the time, about 10 years later, he had gotten rid of all of the film cameras, the Polaroids, all the, all the Kodak film was gone and it was completely 100% digital, no separate cameras. Had, it had all changed. The, the gotcha is if you're not making the changes during that time, though, you know, your days are numbered and mm. you need to be thinking about how do you disrupt that? How do you find some new thing to kind of reinvigorate the organization to put it back on a growth trajectory, kind of re-innovate, mm -hmm. you know, because every idea, every product has a life cycle. We see it again and again and again. They kind of go mm -hmm. through that curve. Well, at the end, you have an opportunity up there where you've you've got all that capital because you're selling a lot of products, you're selling a lot of services, you've got that capital to invest in something new. Most organizations, just the psychology of people in those organizations is it's so much more risky to go back and be George Washington again than to be Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton just isn't as risky, you know, but you have to go, you have to reinvent. Because if you don't, eventually you're just on a slow decline. Uh, Kodak is still around, but who's buying a Kodak camera today? Maybe a hobbyist. It's a, a, a novel, you know, somebody who. It's a novelty. Oh, it's a novel. It's a novelty, exactly. You know, right. the kids might buy them, like my granddaughter. Well, this is a bit fancy. Look at this. You know, but but it is just a novelty. Right. Um, and, and we're seeing that. You know, this innovation. I mean, that's why you look at the likes of. Apple that's constantly innovating. They're Great always example. bringing out something new because they 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 need to to stay 
top of people's mind, stay stay in the game, and keep their um, keep their product relevant in the time in which they are in. Otherwise, you become stale, and all of a sudden, you know, the old you become the BlackBerry. You know, for those of you That's that right. might remember having a BlackBerry, that is no longer you know no longer. I don't even know if they're still around now, or if it's if it's certainly not common um, or or popular these days. You know, people have moved on from that. And then there's the six um, the six category that uh, that we will be able to close on today, which is the disruptors. And, and we are clearly in a very disruptive right. um, environment uh, right now. And and most you know, and we probably have been for a well, in your guys, in, in the American case, probably for the last, what, four or five, maybe four or five presidents, you know, have been in that space of disruption. So let's talk a little bit about that and, and how it applies to, um, from a presidential point of view, but also applies to, uh, you know, business today and, and entrepreneurship. I think, you know, you brought up Apple as an example, and it's an incredible example of, an organization that in the late 70s, early 80s was clearly on that growth path and had clearly kind of peaked and was starting a slow decline. And what the board did at that time is they brought back Steve Jobs. They essentially brought yeah. back George Washington to yeah. come back in and innovate again. And that's really the, that's what should give people hope is that when you bring in that energy again and you rethink it, would anyone today think Apple is less innovative than they were when they invented the Apple, the Apple II and the Macintosh? Not at all. Think of the transformation that's happened in that second wave. Think of mm -hmm. the iPad, the iPod, the iPhone, the watch, Apple Pay. Think of all those innovations, and I'm leaving out a dozen of them that are important mm -hmm. There's a lot of hope there. And what we see in the United States now over the last series of presidents, you know, uh, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, has all been about what is that new idea going to be? What it, it's almost like, you know, we're going back and we need that George Washington type figure again to provide a new vision for what that next curve is going to look like. And that's it's really when I think about okay, well, so many people can be can feel really negative right now about all the things that are going on, and I'm not. And the reason I'm not is there's so much opportunity. You don't. It doesn't have to be a decline. It doesn't have to be Kodak. It can be Apple. There's no reason it can't be, but it takes leadership and it takes mm -hmm. vision. And that's the my standard for a leader in a disruptive time, whether it's an Obama, a Trump, a Biden, or whoever comes next, or whatever corporate leader we're talking about, is do you have the vision to take the organization to that next step? It takes kind of bold, strong, visionary leadership that's positive, that people can get behind. And it, you may argue about how to get there, and Apple famously did. They absolutely famously argued about how to get to the next stage, but they didn't argue with the vision. The vision oh. was to kind of create a new, a completely new ecosystem of products. Well, exactly how that happened. You can read biographies of Steve Jobs and his team. They argued furiously about how to do that. That's okay. But there was mm -hmm. no doubt that they wanted the iPod, the iPhone, the iPad, the watch, all of those innovations, like, hey, that's what we're going for. Let's figure out how to get there together. And it can be done. There's so many great examples. And that's what gives me hope for not just the United States, but, you know, uh, pandemics, things, supply chain shortages are opportunities for organizations to rethink their business models. Mm -hmm. You know, think about the example of Uber. Uh, in the United States, you know, when I remember speaking with a few business colleagues as the pandemic was starting and I thought, okay, Uber, Lyft, those kind of rideshare services, they're done. There's just no way that they're going to be able to survive. And they were under a lot of stress during that time, but they redefined their business model around food delivery and package delivery. And they saw that people were staying in their homes and they were getting things delivered 
and they still wanted to eat out. They still wanted all the things they could get. And how could they rethink their business model to deliver food and deliver goods to people instead of carrying people around? And mm -hmm. they, so there are opportunities right now. And that's what I would say to entrepreneurs and people who are looking at this right now and thinking, oh, it's just such a mess. A mess creates opportunity. Absolutely. And I, you know, what a great thing to end today's show on is that there is, you know, in, in times of adversity, in times of challenge, in times of when things don't feel quite right, those are those moments that are calling for those of you that are, you know, visionary, that have those leadership qualities. It's are actually calling to you to step forward, to stand up and take a really good look and start being the disruptor and the innovator. Like now the things are disruptive. You know, go in there and start looking at things and how can I innovate on this and what do I do next? And what's interesting about this whole thing is that this is this is cyclical, right? It's, it's, it's cycles with this. So, you know, we, we're through the, we've got a whole lot of disruptors um, in, in governments all over the world right now. You know, there's going to come a time where the new person is going to need, will step forward. We're looking for, you know, we hope there'll be some sort, someone that's got great vision, awesome leadership that, as you say, that we can get behind and really trust in 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 our uh, in our governments and in, in our uh, you know powers that be again. And I think that's really something that is being called for and being called for fast. So um, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed today's conversation. I want to let everybody know to. where to go and get a copy of your book. It's in it's in um, Amazon. So you can go to Amazon right. and download it. You can also go and grab it, uh, grab the audio version, which is what I did. And I've enjoyed uh, listening uh, to that copy. And where else can people get um, more of you, Jace? Where, where's the best per place for them to be able to hang out with you? The best place to find more information about the book and find ways to get in touch with me is at marketerinchief.com. That website has all of the links to the different books. You can go to Amazon. You can go to Amazon wherever you are in the world. Uh, it's available anywhere. So uh, make sure to go check that out or find me on LinkedIn. Uh, the wonderful thing about having a name like Jason Voyovich is that you're not going to find a whole lot of others. Uh, so you're, if you find that name, you have found me. Just say, hey, I, I, I heard you on Tracy Wilson's show. Let's, let's connect. Let's talk about it a little bit more. Awesome. That's a, a very easy way to get in touch with me. So check it out. I think you'll, uh, I think you'll really enjoy it. I think the, it's history, yes but it's all about how history relates to what you're facing right now. And I think mm -hmm. that's what's valuable about the book. That's why I wrote it. And it absolutely is. I've, um, I have must admit, you know, when you first sent it to me and I'm like, oh, am I going to go down the path of reading American history? You know, being somebody that's not American, here we go. But I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It's been uh, a very interesting the way that you've put it together, the way that you're looking at things um, is definitely from an entrepreneurial or business um, perspective. So if you are somebody who is really, you know, you're looking for something a little bit different, you're wanting to become an entrepreneur, you're wanting to create your own business, or maybe you've got one right now and you're wanting to, to kind of understand what opportunities exist, go and have a little look at uh, the, the book that Jason has written and uh, you can start to study some of these presidents just like he has to understand what opportunities exist for you. Um, one that I want to point out, so for some of you that are, are kind of in the space of oh, COVID-19 and you know what's going on with um, you know with the world right now, go back and actually have a look at Rita's book but maybe you also want to do a little bit of research on uh, Woodrow Wilson who was uh, president way back when back in the 1918s and that was uh, he was in president he was a president when the pandemic um was, or when the last pandemic was around and he was trying to do some stuff around uh war mobilization and covid and there's some correlations that jace uh, that you'll see between what's going on with covid 19 right now right now and um not necessarily the disease itself as jace says but it's 
more about the communication that's surrounding it. So go and have a little look at that. It might be, you might find that fascinating uh, as I will be delving a little bit deeper into that too. So thank you so much for being a wonderful guest today and sharing your knowledge, your expertise and your skills on today's Unlock show. Uh, as you guys know, I'm Tracy Wilson. It's been my pleasure to be your host today and we've had a wonderful guest with us, Jason uh, Vojovic, who has shared his uh, his expertise and make sure that you head on over to marketer and chief com and uh, you'll be able to get more of Jace if you are interested in this particular subject matter. So thanks very much and I'll see you guys again on another episode of The Unlock Show with me, your host Tracy Wilson, next week, Wednesday, 10 a.m. Brisbane time. Thanks very much, Jace. I'll see you Thank again you. soon. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you for having me on. You're very welcome. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week and we'll see you again soon.